I didn't intend to do another video on the subject of jujitsu as it relates to self-defense, but invariably when you cover a topic like this, you'll get some people in the comments that say something along the lines of this. Jiu-jitsu can work in a self-defense situation if you train self-defense jiu-jitsu. If on the other hand, you're training sport jiu-jitsu, you're gonna be woefully unprepared for a real situation. Now, as you can probably surmise from the title of this video, I disagree with that. I think that sport jiu-jitsu is self-defense jiu-jitsu. Let's talk about it. Before we begin, if you like content like this, be sure to like and subscribe. And I also want to mention two things. Number one, my new jujitsu course is out. It's called Old Guy Cheat Code. It contains four hours of great material and it includes content from Roy Dean and Chris Makuda. Uh, you can find that course and all my courses along with swag. If you're into t-shirts, hoodies, rash guards, all that stuff, you can find at rickellis.com and I appreciate your support. The second thing I wanna mention is that I'm going to be in Costa Rica this November, 2023, along with Roy Dean at the Hero BJJ Retreat. If you've never been to a retreat like this, you are missing out. This one is very, very special. The location is spectacular. The, the training is world-class. The accommodations are fantastic. The food is great. It's really a sensory experience that has everything, including camaraderie, friendship, and uh, lots of great training. So if you're interested, there's still a few slots left. Just go to herobjj.com and I look forward to meeting you and getting some good training in with you. Okay, at the risk of kicking over a hornet's nest, let's see if I can make my case that sport jujitsu is self-defense jujitsu. Now, before we begin, let's see if we can arrive at uh, an understanding of what we mean by self-defense jujitsu. What is that? Well, if you look at the Gracie curriculum, for example, among others, typically you see a lot of scenario-based techniques, things like bear hug defense, front and rear, things like uh, rear naked choke defense, standing headlock defense, uh, full Nelson defense, lapel grab defense, uh, Frankenstein choke defense, uh, maybe some scenarios where you have to cover your head to close the distance and get a hold of someone. And the question is, what's wrong with that curriculum? And, and nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that curriculum. I used to teach that curriculum to my students when I ran my school. Uh, when I, before I started jujitsu, Brazilian jujitsu, I used to do a Japanese form of jujitsu that was heavily weighted toward those types of scenario-based techniques. We did all that stuff. We drilled um, lots and lots and lots of self-defense scenarios, and we did lots of judo throws, and we did lots of, you know, kind of standard things that you think of as jujitsu arm bars and triangle chokes and so on. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with those techniques, absolutely nothing wrong with those techniques, but here's the question for you. What does it mean to be effective? What is skill? What is effectiveness? Because knowledge is not the same thing as skill. You could be the world's foremost expert on boxing, but if you've never put on gloves and thrown some hands, you're not gonna be skilled at boxing. So what does it mean to be effective? Well, to answer that question, let me tell a little story. The day I decided to take up Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I walked into a school, I assumed, I thought, I believed that my Japanese Jiu Jitsu was going to uh, give me an advantage of some kind, that I was not going to be completely lost, that I've been training jiu-jitsu for a long time, that I'm going to have some idea, you know, in this Brazilian context. Now, one of the Achilles heels, one of the downsides of that form of jiu-jitsu was that we didn't spar. Uh, and uh, because of that, it was all just kata. It was all just drilling with compliant partners. When I came into a Brazilian jiu-jitsu environment and it was time to spar, I got obliterated. I got absolutely smashed by everyone in that room, even the white belts, and my Japanese jiu-jitsu did not help me even a little bit. I can't, eat, I can't overstate how little my former experience 
uh, was useful in a Brazilian jiu-jitsu context. And the question is why? Well, the answer to that is the question that I just asked. What does it mean to be effective? Well, effectiveness means that you have the skill to implement your game in a dynamic, ever-changing situation against a non-compliant opponent who's trying to implement his game, okay? It's uh, like Glenn Hegstead, the great martial artist says, the only thing that matters in martial arts is what you can do in chaos. And that's true. And so when you spar, there's a certain chaotic nature to it in the sense that you uh, are not doing something choreographed. There's an old expression, your game plan lasts until that first point of contact, okay? Effectiveness is developed through a different mechanism than knowledge. You learn an arm bar on day one when you walk into a jiu-jitsu academy as a white belt. Okay, great. You know how to do an arm bar, but you're not effective with that arm bar. In fact, you're going to learn a lot of things as a white belt. You're not going to be very effective at any of those things. What makes you effective? Well, sparring, repeated exposure over and over and over and over so that you can, you can begin programming your body to feel those moments when a window of opportunity has opened and uh, you can take the appropriate action to begin taking advantage of that moment. And that takes a lot of training. So the question is this, if you train the self-defense curriculum, but you don't spar with that curriculum, and instead, when it's time to bump fists and go, you're just training sport jujitsu. And that's been my experience. At schools that train the self-defense curriculum, typically that's what you do. You drill some self-defense techniques, now it's time to spar, and now you're sparring sport jujitsu. How effective are you going to be with those self-defense techniques? Well, not effective at all. Minimally effective at best, you're going to be highly effective with the techniques that you use day in and day out on the mat, even if it's in a sport context. If you train, let's say, three days a week and you spar seven, eight, nine rounds per night, I mean, that's, let's say, 20 rounds per week, that's 1,000 rounds in one year, that's 3,000 rounds in three years. 3,000 rounds, you have sparred against every body type, you have dealt with the uh, the bodybuilder with giant biceps who's very aggressive but not very technical. You've dealt with the technical nerdy guy who's not very physically imposing, but he's a surgeon on the mat. You, and, and everybody in between. You have dealt with the wrestler. You've dealt with the guy that wants to put you uh, on knee, in knee, under knee on belly. You've dealt with the guy that's a back specialist who's taking your back. You're, you've dealt with everything. You've been smashed and smashed and smashed 3,000 rounds of sparring. What's going to make you more effective in a self-defense encounter? A chaotic, dynamic, unpredictable situation. The repetitions that you've done with your self-defense techniques or the repetitions under pressure that you've done thousands of times in a sporting context? Well, the answer is obvious to me. The repetitions that you've gotten in a sporting context are going to be, are going to give you uh, immense capability in a dynamic situation far beyond what a self-defense uh, technique is going to give you. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't train and drill self-defense techniques. I'm simply talking about what makes effectiveness. Effectiveness requires sparring. And if you think about what it is that we do on the mat, it's largely what uh, Roy Dean calls intuitive body movement. That's all we're doing on the mat, intuitive body movement. You bump fists with someone, even as a white belt. You walk into a school, you know nothing, you bump fists, your opponent is now coming at you, he's getting his grips, he's applying pressures, he's doing things to you. You're going to do something. You're going to use your intuition, you're going to use your, uh, you know, what you're feeling to inform what you should be doing in response to that thing. Now, you might have terrible instincts, you might have bad intuition, you might not have any knowledge, about technically what answers are appropriate in that moment, but you're going to do something. Well, that's what intuitive body movement is. 
And as you train more and more and more over the years, as a black belt, you're still engaging in this intuitive body movement based on what you're feeling. You feel a window of opportunity, you take some action because you've programmed your body to do that thing. In a dynamic self-defense encounter, even if you don't know the quote unquote self-defense techniques, you have learned to have this sensitivity so that you can intuitively adapt to that situation. I have been choked thousands of times in jujitsu. Every conceivable type of choke, north-south choke, bread cutter choke, cross collar choke, anaconda, darse, Peruvian, Peruvian necktie, um, fist choke, Ezekiel choke, you name it. I have been choked a million times in jujitsu over the almost 18 years that I've been doing this. As a result of that, I'm incredibly sensitive to people reaching out to grab my neck. I have a well-honed defense mechanism when it comes to someone grabbing my neck. Someone's trying to get their grip, I'm already answering the phone, I'm burying my neck. I don't know what choke they're trying to hit. I don't really care. I'm just denying it very preemptively, very early. And you can ask my training partners, you can ask the brown belts and the black belts that I train against, how hard am I to choke? I'm hard to choke. I'm not the greatest jujitsu guy in the world, but my defense is pretty darn good. Now, I'm in a self-defense situation, and the only thing I've trained for the last 18 years is sport jujitsu. I don't know what kind of choke this guy's trying to put on me. Maybe he's just trying to grab my neck. But I have built a repeatable, usable skill set that I can draw upon as an automatic reflex due to the hours and hours and hours that I've spent on the mat, even if it's in a sporting context. And that's what's gonna give me effectiveness in a self-defense encounter more than some knowledge about some self-defense techniques. And again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't drill self-defense. I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to scale up the intensity and the resistance. At my old school in Wyoming, uh, we used to have MMA gloves that we'd put on once in a while and we'd go at it. We used to do scenario-based training. We used to do a lot of this stuff. I'm not saying you shouldn't drill it, but what I'm saying is that effectiveness is a byproduct of repeatedly being in a dynamic, chaotic situation. And let's say for the sake of argument that you're right, that the sport game of jiu-jitsu is just a bunch of butt scooters, right? Just a bunch of guard pullers. And pulling guard in a self-defense situation, that's gonna get you, that's gonna get you killed. That's your opinion. Well, is that true? There are lots of guards in jiu-jitsu. Lasso guard, De La Hiva guard, spider guard, collar sleeve guard, uh, butterfly guard, some of the esoteric ones like worm guard, lots and lots of guard systems. All of those guard systems, all of the entanglement systems, even leg entanglement systems, they all have three primary goals. Generally, they all share three primary goals. Goal number one is to limit the mobility of your opponent. Number two is to uh, give yourself leverage so that you can sweep them. And number three, it's to uh, eliminate limbs from the equation. So I'm a sport jujitsu guy. I go into a self-defense encounter. I throw myself on my back and I put this guy into De La Hiva guard. Who has the advantage? Is it the guy on top who's gonna rain down punches on me? Well, if I can implement my De La Hiva efficiently and quickly, and he doesn't know the counters to that because these guard systems are incredibly complex to deal with. Well, I've taken one of his legs out of the equation with one of my legs. I've taken the other leg out of the equation with my other leg, and I've got some grips on at least one of his sleeves, one of his wrists, which means I've taken three of his limbs out of the equation. I have the leverage advantage so I can sweep him, and I'm going to be able to get to the top and implement my game. Now, don't take my word for it. There's an incredible video out there called um, The Ground and Pound Experiment. Firas Zahabi. Firas Zahabi, the great coach out of Toronto who trains George St. Pierre. He's, he's one of the top mixed martial arts coaches in the business. He asked Gary Tonin and Gordon Ryan many, many years ago when they were just up and coming, they weren't MMA guys, he asked them to come in to his school and they did an experiment, and the experiment was great. You guys are just sport jujitsu guys. 
we're going to put you on your back. We're going to bring in some strikers with gloves. The strikers, their only goal is to make contact with their fists. Your goal on the bottom is to sweep, submit, or get up and flee without taking damage. How do you think it went down? It ended up being trivial for those guys, those jujitsu guys, to deal with that situation. Nobody got hit. The strikers got tapped and tapped and tapped and swept and reversed, and they were able to flee. So even if you're right, even if sport jujitsu is nothing but a bunch of guard players, you take one of your well-honed guard systems and you put a normal human being in one of those guards, they're going to be clueless. It's complicated to deal with some of these guards. I'm not saying that in a self-defense encounter, you should throw yourself on your back. I, I haven't said anything about strategy. And strategy is a deep subject. It starts with situational awareness. You go into a, into a restaurant, where are the exits, right? And then there's verbal de-escalation, and then there's environmental concerns. I mean, there's a whole system of self-defense that you should be running anytime you're out in the real world. I've said nothing about that. I'm simply responding to those that say that sport jujitsu isn't self-defense jujitsu. So, so that's my argument today, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts below. Maybe you agree, maybe you disagree, and if you disagree, I welcome it, but just state your case respectfully. We're all friends here. We're all trying to become better martial artists, and uh, as they say, everybody has an opinion, and nobody's wrong. Let's talk next time.